so week one was living in the spirit. We're on week two, which is hearing in the spirit. And what we're going to discover today is that God speaks to every single one of you through his spirit. Because the Holy Spirit is a person, then the Holy Spirit actually speaks. And the Holy Spirit can speak to us because he is a person. See, you know, this is, I think, the big difference between Christianity and all the other world religions. Every religion, you know, they all talk to their God, right? They all pray or talk to their God in some way. But Christianity is the only religion where our God actually speaks back to us. And that's the big difference because we serve a living God. We serve a, a Christ who died and rose again and forever lives and his spirit lives in us and his whole Holy Spirit speaks to us. And so what we're going to look at today is we're going to look at the fact that, that the Holy Spirit speaks to us. And there's all kinds of examples in Scripture. In fact, there are, are hundreds and hundreds of, of examples. But let me just give you one little story that many of you will remember. It's in the book of Revelation. It's in chapter 2. We have John the Apostle, and he is in the Spirit in the Lord's day. And what happens is he has this amazing encounter with the Holy Spirit. And one of the things he's asked to do is write seven letters to the seven churches in Asia Minor. Now, every one of those letters says something unique and specific for the particular church, right? But all seven of those letters end with the exact same line, and it goes like this. Let he who has an ear to hear, hear what the Spirit is saying to the churches. You know what that means? That means the Holy Spirit is speaking, but we are not necessarily listening. Every married person in the room knows exactly what I'm talking about, <laughs> right? Every wife has encountered this with her husband. I know it. Let me, let me give you an example of this. I am not, admittedly, I am not a great multitasker. I cannot do two things at once. In fact, I've discovered sometimes I can't do one thing at a time. <laughs> And I think, people think that you can multitask. I can't, maybe they can't. I can't listen to two things at once. I can't talk to somebody and watch TV. I can't listen to the radio and talk. I can't do it. I can only can do one thing at a time. Kathy doesn't understand that about me. And so one day I am sitting there and I'm watching television and she comes down and she says, these are her words. She says, oh good, you're not doing anything. I'm thinking, not doing anything. I'm watching American Ninja Warriors. How much, how much more can you be? I mean, that takes an immense amount of concentration to be able to watch a program like that. It's, a, it's an intellectual program. And so, so I'm, I'm watching this, and she says, good, you're not doing anything. She starts talking to me. Now I have a decision to make. I can watch my program, or I can listen. I can't do both things. So I choose wisely to watch my program. <laughs> And so she's talking away, and I'm faking it the whole time. So she's saying stuff, and I'm going, uh-huh. Uh-huh, that's a good point. Uh-huh, and I'm just saying those things. I have literally not heard a word she has said for 10 minutes. And then all of a sudden, just sort of out of the corner of my ear, if there's such a thing, I hear her saying, so what do you think? Should we do it? Now I've got a decision to make, don't I? I can either admit to her that I have not been listening for 10 minutes, which would not bode well for me, or I can fake it and agree with it, which might be the less painful of the two. Not sure yet. So I said, yeah, sure, it sounds great, let's do it, not knowing what I agreed to do. <laughs> so we took up the ballroom dancing, <laughs> like I had agreed. This is absolutely true. We did six, my inattentiveness cost me six months of ballroom dancing. <laughs> And uh, turns out that I quite enjoyed it and got quite good at it, particularly the East Coast Swing. And before you men start laughing at me as a dancer, let me tell you something. Dancing is very macho. And I recently discovered that Chuck Norris does ballroom dancing. Yeah, I found a picture of him. Look, look, he's busting out on a move right, <laughs> right there, practicing his dance moves. You know what I'd love to see? I'd love to see Chuck Norris on Dancing with the Stars, hey? Eh? He's going to win for sure. I mean, for one thing, he'll kill all the other contestants because, you know, that's what Chuck Norris does. But, uh, but he wins everything. I mean, he always, Chuck Norris always, I don't know if you know that about him, he always wins, right? He once played Russian roulette with a fully loaded gun, won. He once had a staring contest with the sun, won. Uh, do you know this, in fact, you know that he was born, Chuck Norris was born on May 6th, 1945. Germany surrendered on May 7th, 1945. Coincidence? I think not. So don't get me going on Chuck Norris jokes, because I actually know a lot of them. <laughs> 
So what we're really talking about here today is we're talking about the fact that the Holy Spirit speaks. We're just not always listening. And what we also know from Scripture, Hebrews chapter 1, verse 1 says this, in various times, in various ways, God has spoken to us in the past. So that means God speaks to us in various and sundry ways. God doesn't always speak the same way. And so what we're going to do today, it's not an exhaustive list, but we're going to look at at least five different ways that the Holy Spirit speaks to us. The first one, probably the least glamorous of them all, is this. God speaks to us through his word. It actually doesn't get more simple than that. The word of God is a very reliable form of the Holy Spirit speaking to you. Now, before I explain how it works, let me show you a verse on this. And if you go with me to, to 2 Peter chapter 1, we're going to uh, look at a little story here. We're going to pick it up in verse, I should know this, uh, verse 16. And this is what it says. For we did not follow cunningly devised fables when we made known to you the power and the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ, but were eyewitnesses of his majesty. For he received from God the Father honor and glory when such a voice came from the excellent glory, this is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. And we heard this voice which came from heaven when we were with him on the holy mountain. I want you to think about this story. Do you know what he's describing? Do you know what incident? It's in Matthew chapter 17, isn't it? It's the Mount of Transfiguration where Peter, John, and James went up with Jesus, just the three of them. They went up with Jesus. Jesus was miraculously somehow transformed or transfigured, and the voice from heaven comes and says, this is my beloved uh, uh, son in whom I'm well pleased. I want you to think about what he's describing. He says, I was an eyewitness. I was there. I was one of only three human beings on the entire planet that saw what I saw, and we heard the audible voice of, of God come from heaven. I mean, when you think about Peter, how many of you are just a little bit jealous of Peter with his encounters with Jesus? I mean, goodness, he walked with him, lived with him, he saw him transfigured, he heard the voice from heaven. Does it get any better than that? I mean, this is an extraordinary encounter with God. But look what he says next. He says, but we have a prophetic word made more sure which you do well to heed as a light that shines in a dark place until the day dawns and the morning star rises in your heart, knowing this first, that no prophecy of Scripture is of any private interpretation. Did you catch what he said? He said, I was there. I was on the Mount of Transfiguration. I heard the voice from heaven. I saw him. I touched him. I heard him. And yet we have a prophetic word made more sure, the word of God, the Scripture. That's what he's telling you. He, was, he is saying even the, the voice of heaven is not as reliable as the word of God that we have. Jesus said heaven and earth will pass away, but my word will never pass away. If you have the word of God, you can go to the bank. That is God speaking to you. Now, let's talk about how that works for a minute because I think it's sort of a challenge. Sometimes you have read for hours on end and got nothing out of it. And this is how it works. I have discovered... What the, what the Holy Spirit does is, is you read the Word of God. You don't always get everything. You always don't get everything personally out of it when you read it. But every once in a while, what happens is as you're reading, it's like the Holy Spirit illuminates it, and all of a sudden the light goes on, right? Maybe you've heard this verse, read this verse 20 times, or maybe you've heard the preacher preach on it 25 times, and then all of a sudden, one day, that verse comes alive. It's as if the Holy Spirit uh, illuminates it, and it's just for you at that moment. How many of you know what I'm talking about? And God will speak to you. I'm telling you, I hear more from God through his word than any other way. I would love to tell you I have this, this secret red phone in my office. And, you know, I just, you know, wait for it to ring and pick it up. It's, it's there. It just never rung. And uh, we hear from God through his word. And the more time you spend in your word, I promise you this. If you will spend time reading his word, I promise you that the Holy Spirit, not in every verse, but the Holy Spirit will illuminate things just for you. And you'll know God's speaking to you. Let me give you a kind of a dramatic example of this. Is, uh, one summer we were staying in this cabin, and this cabin had no restroom, no washroom in it. And the w washrooms were like down this path 100 yards. And, and so we were, it was night, and we had gone to bed, and we were just tucking in. And you know how it's like, you know, it's cold and moist out. And we, I just tucked into bed like this and had the covers all up. And just in that moment, as I'm about to turn off the lights, Kathy says, I need to go use the ladies' room. And I said, well, good luck with that. And, and, and she says, no, I, want, I know I want you to come with me. And she said, well, I said, well, I'm good. 
I don't need to go. And she says, no, no, you're missing the point. She says, I don't want to walk down that dark path through the woods by myself. I want you to come with me. And I said, why? Why wouldn't you want to walk down that path? Guy, eh? You know, total caveman. Not getting why my wife might not want to walk. And she, and she starts explaining, well, I, don't want to, I just don't want to do that. And I said, well, it's not like there's going to be any bear. She says, what if there is a bear? And I said, well, then it at least it only eats one of us, for goodness sakes. I, I was just not empathizing with her, not sympathizing with her. And I'm ashamed to tell you this, but in the end, I said no. And I would not go. I was comfy. Did I mention I was comfy? And, uh, and so I didn't go. And she was kind of miffed with me. And she goes out the door and down the path. And I think, well, i got to leave the light on for her. So maybe I'll also, spiritual, read my Bible till she gets back. So I open up my Bible. I happen to be reading in, in Isaiah chapter 19. And guess what verse I read? The verse says this. It says, in that day, Egypt will be like women and will be afraid. And even though that's out of context, in that moment, I knew exactly what God was saying to me, trying to get me to empathize with my wife. And I thought, uh-oh. I jumped to my feet, leaped out of bed in my PJs, ran down the path so, before she had even got to the building there, and waited so chivalrously outside for her to come out so I could escort her back <laughs> to, to the cabin. Not only did I that day obey the voice of God, but I may have saved my marriage. <laughs> <laughs> So that's a very simple example of how God just illuminates his word, sometimes a little bit out of context, because he wants to speak to you, and God's word will speak to you, and the Holy Spirit will illuminate it so that it makes sense for you and for your situation. So that's number one. Now, number two is actually the little more spiritual. See, he said he would pour out his spirit upon all flesh. Your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. You shall, young men will see visions. Old men will dream dreams. And upon all flesh, I will pour out my spirit. So if he's going to have us prophesying, if he's going to have us doing these things, he's going to have to speak to us. And uh, one of the ways that God speaks to us is through what I call the still, small voice. And let me give you the story. It's in 1 Kings chapter 19. We have a very dramatic encounter of Elijah. Elijah has challenged the 400 prophets of Baal to a contest to see who can call down fire from heaven. They fail miserably all day long trying, and he prays once, and fire comes down from heaven, consumes the altar, consumes the water around the altar, and then he takes the 400 prophets down to the brook. He slays all of them. Then he goes and he bows towards the east, and he prays, and the three-and-a-half-year drought, where it has not rained for three-and-a-half years, uh, it ends, and there is this great deluge of rain. I would say, on balance, pretty good day. What do you think? Elijah's had a very good day. But then what happens is he hears from Jezebel. Remember Jezebel, Ahab's wife, the wicked witch of the West? And she doesn't like it, Elijah. And so she said, buddy, you may have done this, but by the end of the day, you're dead meat. And what does he do? He runs off afraid of Jezebel and hides in a cave. You know what my conclusion of all this is so far? Number one, women are afraid of the dark. Number two, men are afraid of women. <laughs> this is what I'm getting from the Bible. I don't know what you're figuring out. So anyway, he runs away. I mean, weird, right? Just took on 400 prophets of Baal, and now he's afraid of one little lowly king's wife named Jezebel. And so he's hiding away, pouting in the cave, feeling all sorry for himself, and God needs to get through to him. So this is what, what the Lord does. First of all, he sends a great wind. And the great wind, wind even smashed the rocks that were around the cave. And it says, but the Lord was not in the wind. And then after the wind, he sent an earthquake. And after the great earthquake, the Lord was not in the earthquake. And he sent a fire. And the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire, he spoke in a still, small voice. And don't miss this. And then it says, and Elijah heard it. You see, if we're going to hear the still small voice, you know what? We have to tune out the world. 
You have to quiet down. You have to, you can't hear God in the still small voice and listen to all the noise and cacophony and all the stuff going on around you. You, we always think, well, if God's going to speak to me, it's going to be some sort of cataclysmic thing. It's going to, he's going to strike me with lightning. You probably don't want to be struck by lightning. It's just a thought. Uh, that is not how God speaks. The earthquake, the fire, the, the great wind, and God wasn't in any of them. And he was teaching Elijah how to hear from God. And he gave him the still small voice. And this is what I've discovered, is that when we tune out the world, when we get quiet, real quiet before God, every single one of us, because the Holy Spirit lives in us, every single one of us has the ability to hear the still small voice. And I know the first question people have, they say, well, how would I recognize the still small voice? How would I know it's God's voice? And you know, you know what the answer to that is? Is when you practice the presence of God, you actually have, through experience, you learn to recognize his voice. See, see, let me ask you this question. How many of you are married in the room? How many of you are married in the room? If your husband or wife was speaking in the adjoining room within earshot, would you recognize their voice? Let me show you, see your hands. How many of you would recognize their voice? How come? How come you'd recognize his voice? Because you've lived with this person your whole life, and you never went, oh, i got to learn his voice. i got to learn his voice. You don't have to go to any trouble to learn his voice. You know his voice because you've heard it again and again and again. You would recognize the voice of your child. You would recognize the voice of your brother or your sister or your best friend. This is what happens. We, have, through experience, we learn to recognize the voice, and you know the different voices. There's a good chance you can tell the difference between your children without looking around. You can recognize their voices. Why? Because you've lived with them their whole life. Let me tell you a, a great story to illustrate this. When my mother turned 80 years old, we took her to New York City for this little vacation. To, uh, she'd never been there, and, we all, and, and it, was, it was the siblings. It was my brothers and sisters, myself and my mother, and we took her. And what had happened was we all arrived at different times because of flights and different things, and we were going to meet up on the first night. Uh, so, but anyway, the first day uh, I was there, and I think I was with my brother and, and, and one of my sisters, and we decided to go for a little uh, tour on the buses, and they got these double-decker buses in Manhattan. Some of you have been there, the red bus and the blue bus. I think we were on the blue bus, and we were going through town, and we were seeing the sights, and you get on and off the bus. You know, you have your pass, and you get on and off the bus, and you see Manhattan. Well, we have been doing that all morning. It was about noon hour, and around noon hour, we were in Little Italy, and what do you think you would do in Little Italy at noon? Pizza is what you do. You're hungry. It's noon. You're in Little Italy. What else would you do? Pizza. And so we say, hey, let's get off the bus. Go for pizza. So we get off the bus, and, and we're going and looking for a pizza place. We're walking down Canal Street in New York City. As we're walking down this street, I heard a voice on the other side of the street, and the voice said, hey, Mark. Now understand something. I've never been to New York City before in my life. I don't know a single soul there. There are 12 million people living in this city. We're miles and miles away from our hotel. And yet I hear this voice, hey, Mark, and I immediately turn because I recognized it as my brother's voice that had arrived the night before. And I heard my brother's voice. Now, it could have been a construction worker yelling at another construction worker named Mark. But uh, I recognized his voice, and I turned. And who was there? but my brother, right across the street. Can you imagine, what are the odds of this happening? It's a mathematical impossibility for you to run into your brother in New York City with 12 million people on the very first day. I can't even find Kathy in the Walmart, for goodness sakes. <laughs> But I, I, what I don't want you to miss about this is what happens is what, when we live with somebody as the Holy Spirit lives with us, we begin to recognize his voice. And as you learn to recognize his voice, it doesn't take much provocation. You get it. You hear the voice and you immediately can tell the difference. Now, it takes practice, it takes time, and if you've never you know, done this before, as you journey along, you will discover that you can tell the difference between your voice and the other voices around us. Let me tell you a little story about the still small voice that happened this summer. So I, ha I have this boat that I've had for 30 years. My, my dad bought it 45 years ago, and it's about a 15-foot open fishing boat. It's got no bilge pump in it or anything like that. And I've been using it for about 30 years. It's got 25 horsepower tiller motor on the back. And when I'm not there, I pull it up on shore, and it's fine. And when I am there, I put it at the dock. And it has lived through many, many storms. And sometimes I'll go out in the morning, and the thing's half full of water, and I'll bail it. And uh, it's never sunk in, in, 30, in 30 years. Well, this summer, 
It was sitting at the dock, and we had one of those storms. Did anyone notice any storms this summer? Yeah, like every second day, this huge torrential downpour. And so anyway, about midnight, it starts raining. And it's pouring and pouring and pouring and pouring and pouring and pouring. And I just went and fell asleep because I can sleep in a storm. I don't have any problem with that. So I'm sound asleep. Three o'clock in the morning, my eyes pop open, and I'm wide awake. And the, the, the rain has stopped. There's no wind. It's absolutely dead quiet. Maybe that's what woke me up. Maybe the, the lack of noise is what woke me up. All of a sudden, I was wide awake like this. I looked at the clock. It was 3 o'clock in the morning. And then I heard the still, small voice that said this, your boat's on the bottom of the lake. I went, what? <laughs> We've had a lot worse storms than that. I thought, no, my boat's not on the bottom of the lake. I thought, maybe I better get up and look. And so, <laughs> And so I get up and I look and I'm looking out the window. It's in the dark of night and I'm looking out the window down at the dock and I'm thinking, no, I can see the outline of the motor down there. And then I'm looking more carefully and I think, I can see the outline of the motor, but I don't see any outline of any boat. <laughs> so then I, I go down and I turn the lights on and I realize what I saw was my gas tank floating where my boat used to be, thinking that was the motor. And guess where the boat was? The bottom of the lake. Remember, I heard that, right? Someone had told me that. Your boat's on the bottom of the lake. I thought, I can't believe my boat's on the bottom of the lake. And so I went there, and all my stuff's floating around, and the, it probably just sunk. And uh, the paddle was there. I pulled the paddle out, and I pulled the little safety kit out, and I pulled the gas tank out and got them all up on, on, on the ground. And I looked up to heaven. I said, thank you, Lord, for waking me up. But why didn't you wake me up half an hour ago before the thing sunk? <laughs> I could, have, I could have rescued this boat. I was sort of a little frustrated, I was grateful, but thinking, you know, half an hour earlier. But in, the, in that moment, I knew exactly what I needed to do. You know what I did? I went back to bed. <laughs> There's nothing I could do about it at 3 in the morning. It's pitch black, 3 in the morning. You know what I've discovered? I've discovered your problems always look better in the light of day. That's what I've discovered. I thought, There's nothing I can do about it. So God told me it sunk, it sunk, going to bed. Now, don't miss the fact that I rescued all my stuff that would have floated away if I'd waited till morning. So that was good, had all my stuff, went back to bed, had a nice sound sleep. When I woke up in the morning, you know what I did? I had a cup of coffee, because that's what I do. And I'm sitting there sipping my coffee, thinking about what I'm gonna do next. And Kathy comes out, she looks out the window, she goes, Mark, the boat sank! I said, yep. She says, what are you going to do? I said, finish my coffee. <laughs> you know, I mean, it's already down there. I can't change the fact. And then I'd been contemplating during my coffee what I was going to do. And I went down, put on the diving mask, dove to the bottom of the lake, unbolted the motor, tied a rope to the motor, came out, hauled the motor out. And here's the part I didn't tell you. Just a week earlier, I had read an article on how to rescue a submerged outboard. And now I have an opportunity to put it into practice, <laughs> right? All because God didn't wake me up in time. And so, <laughs> and so I got this motor out. Kathy and the, and the girls came down, and they pulled the boat up on shore and got it drained. Within 20 minutes, I had the motor back on that boat and running perfectly. No harm, no foul. Isn't that cool? You say, well... <laughs> You're thinking, I don't know how cool it is. The boat still sunk. Here's what I don't want you to miss. Don't think that just because you can hear from God, you're going to avoid all the problems in life, right? People think, well, you know, I hear from God. It means I'm not going to have any problems in life. Are you kidding? Sometimes he'll just warn you of the problems that are to come. Don't think for a moment that he's going to allow you to escape everything. We are better and stronger people because we go through challenges in life. And don't think God's going to allow you to miss out on that. I am a richer person for it because I now know how to rescue an outboard motor from a submerged state. Do you? <laughs> and I give God the glory for it. So, so we just need to get a grip. Now, let me tell you a far more important story, because you know what? That's just stuff. At the end of the day, who really cares? It's just stuff. Let me talk about something more important, and it's people. Some of you know Pastor Ian Bird, who pastors Church of the Rock Calgary, great friend of ours. And uh, he told me this story recently about this fellow, Jerry, in their church. And Jerry hadn't been in church for quite a long time. He'd kind of forgotten about him. And one day, he felt like the Holy Spirit sort of twigged him and said, 
you need to text Jerry and see how he's doing. So he went to his phone, he texted Jerry, he said, Jerry, how are you doing? We've missed you in church. Uh, where have you been, uh, Pastor Ian? He gets a text back and says, this isn't Jerry's phone. You must have the wrong number. What had happened had been so long, the phone number had been reassigned to somebody else. And the news guy's name was OJ. And OJ texts back and says, sorry, you've got the wrong number. And so then Ian texts back and says, oh, sorry to have bothered you. And, and OJ, he texts back and he says, no, no problem at all. Maybe this is a sign from above. What church do you pastor? And so Ian tells them when and where they meet. And on Sunday morning, guess who shows up? OJ comes to church because he got a mistaken text. Now, this is what had happened. You're going to love this. His wife was a Christian. She had been praying for him. OJ was a new ager. And when he got this text, he thought, must be a sign from the cosmos. I, I better obey. And so he came to church based on what he figured must have been some, some you know, collaboration in the space-time continuum and, and the cosmic universality, right? And so, so he comes to church, and so Ian thinks, wow, this is going to be great. This guy is going to become a Christian today. He didn't. Came a week after week after week after month after month, and he sat in, in the seat there. And then after about three or four months, at the end of one service, during the invitation, guess who puts up his hand but OJ and invites Jesus into his heart to be his Lord and Savior. <laughs> All because Ian texted Jerry, who, who knows where Jerry is? God's going to get, <laughs> God's gonna have to deal with Jerry some other way, I guess, because we can't get a hold of him. But you see, this is how powerful and important this still small voices and you can all hear from him and you all can learn in as you practice the presence of God you will learn by experience to identify the voice of God now let me go on to the next one number three we hear from God in the audible voice of God that's when God speaks in an audible sense to us now this is quite a bit more rare and I want to take you to a story that appears in Acts Chapter 10. So let's flip over to Acts chapter 10, or you can look on the screen here. And uh, this is what it says. I'll get there. Don't worry. Okay. Here we are. Uh, verse 9. The next day, as they went on their journey and drew near the city, Peter went up on the housetop to pray about the sixth hour. Then he became very hungry and wanted to eat. But while they made ready, he fell into a trance. Now, I love this story. So it's the sixth hour, which is around noon. He decides he's going to go up and pray to the house stop. He goes up there, and he immediately gets distracted. From what? <laughs> he got hungry. Like, this has never happened to you? Yeah, I'm going to go pray. Yeah, I'm going up to pray for an hour. Oh, am I ever hungry? I can pray anytime. I need to eat. And God has to arrest him and put him into a trance because he was bailing on the prayer session, wasn't he? he? He was hungry. He got hungry. He got distracted by that. Every one of you is recognizing this. Some of you think, Pastor Mark, it's almost noon now. I'm, I'm, getting, <laughs> I'm getting hungry. Well, you just might fall into a trance before I'm done here. And so, so this is what happens. So God arrests him in this moment as he's on the rooftop. And let's pick it up here. And, and then it says this. He fell into a trance, verse 11, and saw heaven opened and an object like a great sheet bound at the four corners descended to him and let down to the earth. In it were all kinds of four-footed animals of the earth, wild beasts, creeping things, and birds of the air. And a voice came to him, rise, Peter, kill and eat. But Peter said, not so, Lord, for I have never eaten anything common or unclean. And a voice spoke to him again the second time, what God has cleansed, you must not call common. This was done three times, and the object was taken up into heaven again. Now, there's a bunch of stuff going on here. First of all, he, he's seen a vision, right? We're going to talk about that in a moment. But he's also hearing the audible voice of God, right? Arise, Peter, kill, and eat. So he's given some very specific instructions. This is what we know from Scripture about the audible voice of God. That is not how God commonly speaks to people. You go through Scripture, it's few and far between. And in fact, when God speaks to his people in the audible voice, you know it's always some extraordinary assignment. I want you to think about that. Noah heard the voice of God, the audible voice of God, said, Noah, build a boat. Was that important? Was it important? 
It was 100 years of his life. He had to build a boat because there was a huge flood that came, rained for 40 days and 40 nights. It was a big deal. He came to Moses and he spoke in the audible voice and he said, go back to the Pharaoh's court and say, let my people go. Big deal? Yeah, 430 years of captivity, he needed to get those people out. And so when God spoke, big assignment, Gideon. He's in the bottom of the wine press, right? We talk about this lots. And God spoke to him and says, Arise in this mighty yours, you mighty man of valor, and you will defeat the Midianites as one man. Big deal? Yeah, you better believe it. See, this is what we discover about the audible voice of God. If there's something that God really needs to get through to you, then, and, and you aren't hearing it any other way, God will speak audibly to get your attention. Isn't that how, isn't that how kind of life works? You know, when, you, when, you, when you're talking to your kids, right? Jordan, Jordan, Jordan! Huh? All of a sudden, what, the audible voice, you know? We get through to our kids by using the audible voice of, uh, of ourselves. And the same thing is true with God. And if you're hearing the audible voice of God, then it's probably an extraordinary assignment. Now, I'm not saying it doesn't happen, but I'm saying it's pretty rare. You know, when I first became a Christian, we were probably one of these kind of kind of outlandish, kind of out there kind of churches. And I go to these prayer meetings, everybody around me was all hearing from God. I mean, man, they all had the hotline going. And they were all hearing from God. I'm thinking, what's going on here? And the people come into the prayer room and I said, I, you know, woke up this morning, God said, yo, girl, wear the red dress, not the blue one. The blue one makes you look fat. <laughs> and, and I'm thinking, wow, these people really hear from God. God's telling them what to wear in the morning. I want you to think about that for a moment. If that's true, if God told you what dress to wear in the morning, told you not to wear the blue one, and you wore the blue one, A, you're in disobedience to God, and B, you look fat, right? I mean, you know, do you really want that kind of responsibility? That, that every little thing in your life, do you really think God cares what kind of dress you're wearing? And see, here's what happens in this story. We have this story where, where the audible voice of, of God comes and says, Peter, now remember, remember what he was? What was he distracted about? What was it again? He was hungry. He was hungry while he was praying. And he gets this vision of stuff that sort of vaguely re resembles food. Forbidden foods in the Jew Jew Jewish dietary laws, right? Forbidden foods. He gets this vision of this. And the voice says, arise, Peter, kill and eat. Now, what we do falsely is we assume that he's referring to to lunch. Do we honestly think that God went to all this trouble to let Peter know, hey, Peter, it's lunchtime. Let me let you know, go for the Baconator. Go for it. I know you've never had one before, but you can have it. Do it. The Baconator won't kill you. Don't say it. Is this story talking about the Baconator? Is this story talking about lunch? Read the story. What is, what is the unclean and common that is being referred to in this story? Anybody know? It's talking about the Gentiles. This whole story, this whole encounter, remember, it's a dramatic, important, extraordinary ordeal. This whole thing is about taking the gospel to the Gentiles for the first time in history, and Peter goes to the Roman Cornelius' house and preaches to the gospel to the Romans, which he wouldn't have done because he thought they were unclean and common, and God gives him this example, this sort of metaphoric, symbolic answer to let him know that he needs to go. It has nothing to do with what Cornelius is serving for lunch when he gets there, right? I don't think so. So on this point of the audible voice of God, you may hear the audible voice of God in your life. I doubt it. I have never heard the audible voice of God, and frankly, I don't want to because I have no means I'm probably not listening any other way, right? And so there's the audible voice of God. Then the last and the final thing, the fourth and the fifth way that God speaks to us is visions and dreams. And he says that in that day, he will pour out his spirit upon all flesh. He says, your young men will see visions, your old men will dream, dream dreams. So that determines whether you're young or old, right? I guess I'm old because that's what I get. God speaks to me through dreams. And so what we have in this story is we have a vision in particular. And the big difference between visions and dreams, this is really deep, so you might want to write this down. Visions you have while you're awake, dreams you have while you're asleep. That's the big difference. <laughs> for the most part, don't boo me. For, <laughs> for the most part, uh, dreams and visions are symbolic. 
And they are not literal, and they mean something else. If you go through scripture, you look at the dreams and visions, almost every time, now not necessarily every time, but almost every time, we see that they're somehow metaphorical or they're somehow symbolic. You'll remember uh, Joseph had a dream. He must have been an old man, right? He was just a young guy. He had a dream, and the dream was, was these sheaves, and these sheaves were, these 12 sheaves were bowing down to his sheaf. Now, was it about sheaves of wheat? Is that what it was all about? No, they were symbolic of something. What? His brothers, his 10 brothers bowing down to him, and his mother and his father bowing down to him. And so we know that that story was actually not literal, but it was symbolic. Then he goes to, to uh, Egypt, and the Pharaoh has a dream. And remember in the, in the Pharaoh's dream, there was seven fat calves, or fat cows, and there was, it was seven lean cows. And was it, was it all about cows? No, it was symbolic of what? It was about seven good years and seven bad years. And so as we go through scripture, we discover that these dreams and these visions primarily are symbolic and have to be interpreted in some way. And interpreted, really, you typically will know. He, he knew, Joseph knew right away what it meant. And when you get a dream, when you get a vision, if it's of God, you will almost always know exactly what it means. You will wake up in the morning and you will first of all know that that was a God dream. There's a big difference between a God dream and a pizza dream. How many of you ever had a pizza dream? You know, you all had them, and don't try to interpret them, because it won't be pretty. And you know what the book of Ecclesiastes tells us? It tells us that dreams come because of the busyness of mind. Do you know, have, how many of you have noticed that the dreams you have at night are oftentimes what you were thinking about before you went to bed? And they're not necessarily spiritual dreams. They're not necessarily of God. But when you get a spiritual dream, when something happens, like what happened here with Peter, and it's extraordinary, and he knew exactly what it went, and when Cornelius invited him, he went to the house to preach the gospel because he knew what the vision meant. And when you get that dream or vision, you will almost always know exactly what it means. Let me close with one final story. About 20 years ago, I had this dream. And uh, it was one of those crazy, surreal dreams, didn't kind of make sense. And somehow it was all about television ministry and ministering through television. And there was this, this image in the, in the you know, it's hard to describe a dream because they're always kind of weird. But in this dream, I saw the street lights and I saw the red light and the green light and the yellow light and I saw red and then I saw green. And then I saw blinking yellow. And the blinking yellow went on. Who, who knows what blinking yellow means? What does it wasn't me. Caution, or more specifically, if you see a blink, it means proceed with caution. Proceed with caution. And so I woke up from this dream, and immediately I knew what the dream was about. It was about television ministry, and it was about proceeding with caution, and I immediately knew who it was for. It must be for Willard Teason of Trinity Television, and it's a new day. <laughs> I just assumed that's who it was for. So you know what I did? I phoned him up right away. And I phoned up uh, Willard. Willard was actually here this morning and, and in this early service and, and when I was telling this story. And so I phoned up Willard and I said, Willard, I had a dream last night. I need to tell you about it. Uh, can we go for lunch? I'll buy you lunch. He said, sure. So we go out for lunch and I'm telling him this dream. And as I'm telling him this dream, he's kind of glazing over. Have you, have you noticed how people hate listening to your dreams? People don't want to listen to your dreams. Have you noticed that? I'm always looking for someone that wants to listen to me. Yeah, yeah, whatever. You know, they're always so surreal and hard to follow. They don't make any sense. So even though Willard is sort of this irrepressibly positive person, I could tell he was going, oh, that's great. Yeah, thanks. Great. Thanks, Mark. I'm telling this dream because they were in the midst of developing Now TV, which is a 24-hour Christian television station. They were right in the midst of that. And I was telling them this dream meant that he was to proceed with caution. And so he's going, yeah, okay. And I could see in his eyes, he was going okay with his mouth, and his eyes were saying, you're an idiot, leave me alone. <laughs> he would never say that, because he's way too nice of a guy. But I could tell I was getting that vibe for him. And for, in fact, today, when I went to, to ask him for permission to have told his story, uh, he <laughs> you got that, didn't you? He said, you know what, I don't even remember that. He didn't even remember it. That's how meaningful and impactful it was in his life. <laughs> And so I'm driving back from this encounter. I'm driving back to the office, and I'm kind of miffed about it. And I'm driving back, and I'm thinking, so I go to all the trouble of having this dream. I go to all the trouble of taking him out for lunch and telling him the dream. I go to all the trouble of paying for lunch. Did I mention that? And, uh, and, and he won't, didn't, even, didn't even receive the dream. And so as I'm driving back, and I'm honestly a little bit perturbed, and as I'm driving back, I hear the still, small voice. And the still, small voice says, 
who said the dream was for him? <laughs> I went, what? <laughs> I just assumed it was for him because he was the one in television ministry. And I thought, well, if it's not for him, who's it for? <laughs> not too smart, you know. <laughs> and then I felt like the Lord said, you. <laughs> I go, oh my. And all of a sudden it became clear. We met in their building. Our church met in their building on a stage that had television lights all around it like this with television cameras that were in the next room on extraordinary long cords attached to a bunch of fancy TV machines. And we had in the third row Ernie, who still to this day produces our television program, sitting in the third row doing nothing. And so all of a sudden I real, realized that all of this had lined up, that God wasn't speaking to me about somebody else. He was speaking to me about me and told me what it was all about. And I thought, I know exactly what we need to do. We need to start television ministry and proceed with caution. We went to Trinity Television. They loaned us the, rented rather the equipment. We went to a little television station, the Importers of Prairie. It was called MTN. Remember MTN? And they agreed to take us and air us. And we went on air that first year in one little country station. And then what we did was year after year, we just took on one city after another. We proceeded with caution. We never borrowed money, never took airtime on credit, always paid our bills right on time every single year. And the next thing you know, our television program was across Canada. And today, after 19 years, there's 200,000 people tuning in every Sunday morning. <laughs> That's what happens when you listen to God. So I would highly recommend it because the scripture says this, let he who has an ear hear what the spirit says to the church. Let's stand together, shall we? I want to ask the worship team to come up and we're going to take a few moments here and it's not going to be really long and we're going to give you an opportunity to hear from God today. And we're going to show you, we're going to go through an exercise to show you how to hear from the still small voice of, of the Holy Spirit. So don't run off if you absolutely don't have, have to and the kids aren't being dismissed. Before we do that, I need to ask you all to bow your heads and close your eyes just for a moment, if you would. Because in a room this size, there are likely being people that have never invited Jesus into their heart to be their Lord and Savior. And I want to give you an opportunity to do that. I'm not going to call you for it or single you out but you do need to make a decision today. If you have gone to church, have been baptized as an infant, that's not what I'm asking. I'm asking you this. Have you had the definitive moment where you've accepted the work of the cross, invited Jesus into your life, and made him your Lord? And if you haven't done that, you're going to have a hard time doing any of the stuff I'm talking about today because it requires Jesus to come and live in you. And so I'm not going to call you forward or single you out, but if that's you and you'd like to make a decision to be a follower of Christ today, I want you to just slip up your hand right where you are. Won't call you forward. I'm not going to ask you to say anything publicly. Just take a moment. Just raise your hand wherever you are in the room. Just let me see it. Once I've seen it, you can put it down again. All right? Okay. Okay, you can put your hands down. We'll just take a moment to do this because I said I wouldn't single anybody out. Let's all pray together. Lord Jesus. I thank you for the work of the cross that you died for my sin. You rose again on the third day and you forever live to be my Lord. Old things have passed away. All things have become new. Today I'm a new creation in Christ. Today I'm a Christian. And your Holy Spirit dwells in me. And your Holy Spirit speaks to me through the still small voice and I attend my hearing to you in Jesus name Amen